Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, CIBC Wood Gundy's Ross Clark expects equity markets to test new lows. Inc. Research CEO Ted Dixon wishes political leaders would outline clear economic plans. Venable Park Investment Council President Danielle Park believes Canada's next recession will be brutal. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Unbelievable harmonies, spectacular performance, Bird Dog and the Vintage Electric Band, the ultimate tribute to the Everly Brothers and Simon and Garfunkel in Oliver, October 2nd, in Kelowna, October 3rd. Buy online and save at OnTourTickets.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark, Investment Advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. Welcome to This Week in Money, Ross. Nice to be with you, Jim. Ross, right now the markets are so volatile. You blink and they go in a totally different direction. What is happening as they close going into the long weekend? Well, going into the long weekend, the uh, market was under pressure. Uh, down on the uh, Friday, uh, just to end off a week that... Uh, was full of uh, volatility, not as much as the preceding week where we had the uh, dramatic open on the 24th and and bounced back uh, through that week. But this week was more of the backing and filling type of action, um, typical of what you would see following a as severe a break as we've seen in the last couple of months. You know, we we went through that extremely tight trading range in the first six months of the year with the broad indices, even though individual stocks and sectors were moving, the broad indices were in that tight, tight range. We then had the 16% drop in the Dow. We had a 12% break in the S&P. And that, that following the Dow theory divergences that we talked about, the failure of transports to match the industrials in the early part of the year, you put all that together, uh, we find that there's uh, six or seven good examples over the last 20 years. There's maybe another f- five or ten uh, prior to that. And the textbook action here would be that the next three to five weeks are just a lot of backing and filling in a broad range, retesting the lows a number of times. And um, if, if we can resolve that by uh, holding in reasonably well, then we can get our seasonal low in place, which is typically there by the end of October. And uh, you know, we've had a, a lot of, quote, panic on the streets, especially when you uh, take the uh, the actual numbers and look at the RIDEX funds. Uh, the movement there from the bullish index funds into the bearish, the inverse funds, has been at a rate of speed that... Um, exceeds what we saw back in October of 08, um, in the end of the dot-com meltdown in September of 02, or after the LTCM collapse, uh, long-term capital, in um, August of 1998. So it's, it's beyond those, the spike, and in each of those examples, you, you had a reasonable bounce but went back down to retest the lows. And I think what investors will need to look at here in the coming weeks is to see which sectors and stocks start to show resilience. Because if you think back to 2008 and into the uh, uh, February, March of 2009, there were a lot of sectors that did not go down and make lower lows in March of 2009. Uh, the financials were the ones that had the bulk of the pressure, but there were others that started to hold in very, very well. Uh, biotechs being a good example, uh, and... Uh, the uh, high-tech stocks, which then went on to become new leaders on the upside. So I think that uh, as we move through September to early October, look for the resilience and uh, see where the uh, the money is starting to move and gravitate towards. Now, of course, you would have to have a crystal ball to know where it's going to go, but is there anything that looks pretty bright? Well, at this point, uh, the uh, the utilities are starting to show a little bit of signs of resilience. Uh, so that that's one thing to look at. You know, I would suggest to people that uh, this this is the time of year that you take a, uh, just a, an overview of your account. Uh, see how much the drawdowns have been during this phase. Uh, you know, the the TSX uh, on the year uh, is down about. Uh, 
eight uh, percent. The S and P is down seven percent on the year. They're much further down from the highs of the year, but that's that's the degree that they're down. And uh, we, you know, talk weekly here uh, about market action and trading opportunities. But I think one needs to take a, you know, a bigger perspective of things and see where they might place money for longer periods of time and uh, who who manages money well and who controls it during the down times, the bad markets. And uh, my partner and I work with a, uh, some of the mutual funds, and I know mutual funds have a, a dirty name as far as a number of investors are concerned, but there are a number of managers out there that we like who have done exceptionally well over time. And, uh, you know, we, uh, that uh, these are the type of uh, funds that are down maybe half of what the market is down this year, um, have excellent track records through the last 10 years, through a full cycle of a bear market and a bull market. And uh, there, uh, there are some very, very attractive items out there. The, uh, you know, for example, the Century Canadian Income Fund, uh, down about 4% year to date, about half of what the TSX is down. But, you know, if we look back to 2008 in the hard break, uh, it held very well. And by the early part of 2010, it was back to new all-time highs. Whereas the S&P took uh, until 2013 and the TSX up until 2014 to make new highs. So it's this, the control of the downside that's important on the accounts because Everybody can make money in a bull market. How do you do in the bad markets that then allows you to come back? Are you surprised that gold hasn't bounced back better considering the markets are down? Well, you know, we mentioned that a week ago because it was, once again, that, that mon- the bad Monday uh, was one of those times that you would expect to see uh, decent action in the, in the gold market. It wasn't capable of doing it then. Um, that's it's it's like the action we saw through the summer with the the Greek and Chinese market uh, meltdowns. That the if the gold market can't do well with that in a favorable seasonal window, and now we're getting into the the latter part of the seasonal um, that uh, carries from mid July through September, late September. Um, it's it's going to be absolutely critical here that we continue to hold this 11.20 range. Um, because we're we're going to run out of the positive seasonal uh, pretty soon here, and uh, we could very easily be looking at uh, new lows again. Ross, have yourself a great long weekend. And you too, Jim. I'll do my best. Coming up next on This Week in Money, Ted Dixon. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. My guest is Ted Dixon, CEO of Inc. Research Corporation. Inc. stands for Insider News and Knowledge and is Canada's first online financial news and research service. Welcome to This Week in Money, Ted. It's great to be back, Jim. The big political debate happening on the election campaign in Canada, is the country in a recession? And if it is, how bad and for how long? Any ideas on that? Well, to use the uh, words of our uh, central bank governor, we're clearly in a contraction, and I think the Bank of Canada has to take some responsibility for that. Uh, when um, uh, the current governor uh, took over his uh, job uh, back in uh, uh, June, July 2013, one of the first things he did was uh, remove the tightening bias, basically loosening monetary conditions, started to devalue the loonie when oil was at a, uh, trading at $100, so it just kind of stoked the fires of an already um, pretty buoyant and uh, uh, hot uh, oil patch. Uh, so uh, uh, I would argue that uh, the Bank of Canada helped uh, generate um, more investment, leading to overinvestment, and now we're paying the price. Now, of course, the Bank of Canada had some help along the way. Uh, the Fed uh, and others, uh, other central banks were also priming the pump, but... Uh, 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 the central bank here at home, uh, I would argue, should have been mindful of the conditions in the oil patch and uh, loosening monetary policy when oil was at $100. Uh, uh, at the time, uh, we uh, raised some concern about that, and uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, now we are in a contraction, if not a recession. Does the central bank of Canada, does it take orders from the government, or, or does it march to its own drummer? I think that's an important question for Canadians to ask themselves what they think. You know, uh, why was there a interest rate cut 100 days 
approximately 100 days before an election. Uh, was it really necessary? Uh, and we'll, we will, you know, we'll find out. Uh, but uh, it's certainly uh, interesting timing, to say the least, that uh, there was a rate cut so so uh, quickly uh, or so soon before an election. Um, uh, but uh, I'm sure there there's all sorts of sort of a rationale for it. We have a, a central bank that believes somehow they can measure the output gap in the economy, and I think the, their mishandling of the uh, situation in the oil patch uh, shows that uh, they don't have a perfect track record, far from it, in that area. So um, we'll see how this all plays out. I think, though, that uh, you know, maybe if uh, if we keep getting uh, this kind of um, I would call it uh, radical monetary policy out of the Bank of Canada that uh, you know we may have bigger problems than just what we've seen in the oil patch. Uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, uh, my fears are unfounded and that uh, everything will work out uh, just fine. But uh, uh, when we have core inflation uh, well above two percent and it's been that way now for almost a year, uh, why we're cutting interest rates? Um, uh, when they're already extremely low levels, uh, it's not like uh, uh, conditions are uh, tight to begin with. Um, well, we'll see how it all works out. Generally, what kind of trends are you seeing in the North American markets, short and long term? Well, right now we're clearly in a period of volatility, and I, you know part of this is the Fed trying to desperately get into a more normal. Um, frame of monetary policy. And what that means for markets is that uh, the, uh, uh, the certainty around monetary policy from the, the Fed is uh, being uh, taken away. And markets don't like uh, uncertainty, and we're getting a repricing in that. Now, uh, what is very interesting is we've seen insiders in both North America and in Canada buying as uh, stocks have sold off here uh, in the late summer. However, we're still not at a position where we would say insiders have confirmed that we're, the worst is over. They, they are buying, and that is because uh, valuations are coming down, and that's usual. But whether valuations can keep getting cheaper, is the jury's still out on that for sure. We have some big data points, uh, and your listeners will have had the benefit of hearing about the job numbers in both Canada and the U.S. in August. Um, and... Uh, that will go a long way to setting expectations for the next Federal Reserve meeting later in this month. We will, you know, we'll have to see again how this plays out because we're, this is now um, in the hands of a number of unelected central bank uh, officials uh, around the world, and particularly in Washington. Uh, they're pulling the strings, and whether they pull the strings in the right direction or not, uh, uh, markets will likely uh, feel the brunt of it if they pull in the wrong direction or push in the wrong direction. With the markets unstable right now, is there a place that you could put your money where you would get a decent return? Well, I think that's the uh, obviously the the problem with this, these zero interest rates. And, um, you know, with as central banks push rates down lower, like we're seeing in Canada, we're just getting money chasing into hot areas. Uh, I mean, I... The CBC uh, National News picked up on this uh, just uh, this week where they were looking at the housing market in Vancouver and they interviewed a, a gentleman who had just moved to Canada and um, one of the rationales uh, that uh, this gentleman was putting a bid on a property, a multi-million dollar property, was that uh, the market was probably going to keep going up. So, uh, you know, this is the type of environment that uh, central banks and the Bank of Canada has created in this country. and um, it's very difficult to find places to put your money in uh, uh, that you know that can provide um, a risk, a good risk-adjusted return, and this is why investors have to be very cautious, particularly as the Fed now is trying to get away from this zero interest rate policy. Uh, you know, the chances of them being able to succeed are not a, are not. I wouldn't say anywhere near ninety percent. You know, may, let's hope it's better than 50-50, but uh, one has to be aware that this could not follow the script that central bank are uh, hoping to write, and uh, this certainly hasn't followed the script in Canada. This is, you know, what's happening in Canada is not just about uh, the oil price. It is about decisions that were made uh, by the Bank of Canada back in July of, uh, and you know, following July of 2013, and it's about the... Um, I would argue more or less the outsourcing of industrial policy to the Bank of Canada, where the Bank of Canada was expected to uh, prop up uh, or support manufacturing, 
when really isn't that really the job? If, you know, if there is going to be an industrial policy, isn't that really the job of elected officials who you can vote in or vote out of office? Uh, you know, depending on what they do. If someone has a, a policy they think is going to help support manufacturing, that's great. Let's uh, put it to the people and let's have a vote on it. But uh, to turn it over to the central bank, uh, we can see now that uh, using uh, uh, interest rates to uh, favor one sector of the economy can do a great deal of damage in other sectors. The immigration crisis that we're hearing so much about it in Europe. Now, are these people just fleeing bad economic times in Africa? Are they just fleeing for their safety, or is it a combination of both? Well, they, you know, there's, there's uh, always uh, these um, situations uh, in the world, it seems, in varying degrees, and uh, the media attention, um, you know, uh, ebbs and flows, and right now we've seen quite a bit. But it's uh, you know it's it's a very uh, it's a very disturbing situation that we see right now because a lot of tough choices have to be made. And um, uh, so uh, you know on the one hand it's disturbing, on the other hand I think that it's good that Canadians are seeing some of the ramifications of what's going on in the Middle East. We are involved in that uh, militarily, and so there's a number of uh, dynamics that are going on that Canadians, uh, I don't know if, if there have been, you know, uh, until the recent events have really um, to, been, I, I would say, really uh, given the, the whole side of the story. And, um, you know, there is a, a, a lot of... Uh, hardship that's going on in the Middle East, and I think it, 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 it's good that it's become an, an election, on the election radar anyways, because I think that uh, it's good that Canadians have a, an opportunity to, to really uh, think about um, you know our involvement in the Middle East and what it should be. I know when you watch those border security shows on TV, looking for people trying to sneak into your country to work without a work permit seems to be a big deal. Are we going to see more and more of that kind of pressure? Well, you mean in terms of coming to Canada without a work permit? Yes. Is that well, I you know I think that it's pretty hard to come to Canada without a, a work permit. I mean, you get stories about it. I mean, people try, but I mean, you, you know, it 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 really is uh, hard to 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 do that. I mean, there were there were uh, some scrupulous you know, unscrupulous operators, um, you know, a number of years ago uh, trying to uh, to organize, um, uh, you know boats of, of people do, to do that. I mean, that was just a horrible situation where people were trying to exploit uh, very desperate people. So, you know, I, I think that, uh, it, you know, in Canada, in, in the sense, you know, we have geography is, um, you know, is once again our, um, you know, we're blessed with being, you know, pretty much, I wouldn't say isolated, we're not isolated, but, you know, it's a lot harder to sort of get to Canada um, than, you know, some of their countries, as you're seeing in Europe right now, where you, where Europe's in much closer proximity, right, to these combat areas. Back to the political debates that are going on with the election campaign in Canada. Should the Canada pension plan be expanded? Should people be forced to contribute more to it? Should it be voluntary? And should employers be asked to contribute more? Plus, we have provinces now, like Ontario, that want to be involved. Well, that is an issue being... Um, Promoted by Ontario primarily, and I think you know the uh, the initial reaction by a number of uh, Canadians. Oh yes, let's let's expand the pension plans and uh, let's get the employers to pay more. But just you know, let me, let me tell you as a small business person, you know what that means is that uh, it means that before we hire someone new, if if we're as a business we're expected to you know pay an extra fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars a year, we're going to factor that in to our hiring decisions and every small business thinks like that so there's no um, there's no uh, freebie in terms of that policy and you know I think that if governments believe that the pensions have to be expanded then we have to have an honest debate about who's going to pay for it and and if it is supposed to be small business and large business that's going to pay for it well let's get that out in the open but explain that that means there's going to be less jobs created and you know there's a trade off in that case and you know if the people uh, care about Canada's competitiveness you know clearly you know we want to have a competitive economy but we also want to have jobs that pay well and, and you know and 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 have productive um and productive economy but also have an economy that can can help uh, support a standard of living you know but uh, then again uh, you know I'll bring this back to uh, the central bank you know it, it, it's against juicing housing costs uh, up in Canada where hardly anyone in 
uh, just starting out at a university um, in uh, Vancouver or Toronto can afford to buy a house, you know, with any normal time frame, and yet we have a provincial government who's saying, well, no, you know, you, we should be juicing up the uh, the pensions. Well, you can't have everything, and if um, we're going to uh, have a, a if we're going to support a, a central bank that you know, keeps interest rates down at zero, juices up housing costs, juices up housing inflation, increases the cost of living, um, then there's going to be calls for bigger pensions. Fair enough. But then, um, you know, how how do we create those jobs? And, you know, Canadians hopefully will have that discussion during the election campaign and, uh, and, and you know, get, get uh, some straight answers from uh, those running for office as to where their priorities are and just how they're going to... Um, pull these rabbits out of, out of the hats, you know? Yes, and also on the political debate, should uh, the central government run another deficit? Well, I don't think Ottawa's been out of a, a deficit financing position since 2008, or before that even. Right, you know, it, it, it is uh, it, it is quite interesting to hear, uh, or amusing to hear this discussion, because uh, if, if we do head into a prolonged protract, uh, a contraction in Canada, there will be a deficit. It doesn't matter which of those three parties you know, ends up forming the government, uh, or, you know, or for, I don't think the Green Party, uh, is in, you know, they have candidates and they're, they're, uh, on the ballot and they're, um, uh, contenders in many Rodneys, but obviously they're not, uh, in a position to form the government. But, you know, you can have this debate all you want, but if we're in a recession and if we're, if it ends up being a two-year recession, there will be a deficit. It doesn't matter who, who wins. Is it dangerous to expect politicians in Canada, a small country economically, to really have much influence on what happens globally and then what happens to Canada? I mean, if China doesn't buy our commodities, our economy is going to suffer no matter what. You know, that's, that's uh, a very important question for those running for office right now because there is this sort of fatalism that a lot of policymakers would have you believe that well, there's nothing we can do. We're we're you know we're commodity we're a price taker, but it doesn't have to be that way. You know uh, you know it, I, I think that uh, we have to get some some vision from whoever wants to be prime minister after the next um, in the next parliament as to is that. Is that what Canada is faced with, or do we have a way to diversify our economy? Um, and how would we do that? You know, it's uh, and that's you know to, to and that's it's easy to sort of ask that question. It's a lot harder to answer it uh, in a in a convincing way because um, um, it would mean some difficult uh, policy choices. For example, you know, are we how would we diversify our economy and uh, support manufacturing if we're going to bring in a provincial pension plan. Like, how does that all work? And, um, you know, we, we, it's, it's no sense in just talking one political promise uh, and forgetting about the bigger picture. Yet we haven't, as, as far as I'm concerned, at this point in the campaign, we haven't heard anyone put it all together and say, this is how we're going to build a better Canada for the next, uh, you know, generation. You know, we hear that, oh, well, you know, one party says well, one party says they're going to run a deficit. Two parties say they're not going to run a deficit. Okay, but as I mentioned, if we have a two-year recession, I don't care. You know, all, under all three, we're going to have we're going to have a, a deficit. But what kind of deficit, and um, uh, where will that where will that spending go? You know, that's and why will that spending be there? You know, let's have that kind of uh, discussion as opposed to you know whether uh, a tax uh, a tax rebate to fix up your basement. Is better than you know another um, another childcare space, which is you know kind of what we're at right now. Let's hope as we get further down the road into this, we'll all bring it together and we'll have a clearer vision of uh, or clearer view of how these three uh, political leaders see Canada uh, progressing over the next uh, over the next uh, ten years. Like, that's what I'm hoping for for my family that you know that I have a clear uh, vision of of, of where. Uh, of where these policymakers uh, want to take us, and uh, so far, you know, I'm, not, I'm just not hearing that. But uh, maybe it's because my ears are plugged up. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it seems to me there's a lot of regional pandering in Quebec. They they say things that Quebec wants to hear in BC. They say things BC wants to hear. But you're saying I'm a Canadian. I'd like to hear the whole picture. Well, I think that's important because uh, sure there are regional differences, and they call for uh, perhaps you know different policies and different parts of the country, but of course, as well, we also have provincial government, and we have a constitution that does uh, provide flexibility there. Um, so, 
you know, how is it all going to come together, Jim? You know, this is what uh, I think Canadians deserve to hear. And no wonder why they're they're tuning out in so in so many numbers. Uh, Canadians, you know, understand that they're just being pandered to in many respects. And no, I don't think either politician uh, of the three major parties has really captured the attention uh, of uh, Canadians. But that means there's still an opportunity for one of them to emerge with. Uh, or two, you know, or hopefully all three will emerge with strong visions, and then Canadians can vote on which one, uh, which one uh, they seem to offer the that seems to offer the most uh, pro, uh, promise for their, you know, their their kids and and grandkids. And um, you know, let's hope we have that kind of discussion about where we're going to end up as a country uh, ten years from now. Ted, where can people find out more information about Inc. Research? Well, we offer a, f- a free website called CanadianInsider.com, which provides uh, uh, analysis and news on insider activity in Canada. And uh, if they go to our website, uh, they'll see uh, every day how insiders are reacting to uh, the current uh, market uh, turmoil and uh, ups and downs. And uh, when, when they see our indicator moving up, it means uh, insiders are buying. And when they see it moving down, it means they're selling. So that's a good place to check into as a uh, as we get through the month of September here, because it's sure it's not over <laughs> by any stretch. We have we have a lot of news coming our way. Ted, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Thanks, Jim. My guest has been Ted Dixon, CEO of Inc. Research Corporation. Coming up next, Danielle Park on This Week in Money. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. My guest is Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated. Welcome to This Week in Money, Danielle. Hey, Jim. Happy September. The IMF wants the central banks to stimulate the equity markets again to counter slowing economic growth. Is this a good idea? Well, this is the only idea any of them have, you see. It's the same old rerun of the ideas they've been trotting out for the last, you know, five years nonstop. And no, it's not working. It's making things a lot worse. It's um, ended up in a ton of malinvestment and overcapacity in certain areas, um, wasted capital, money that it cares about price and valuations is sort of sitting on the sidelines doing nothing. Speculative capital is swinging for the fences on leverage again at record highs and just getting uh, clocked every time we get a massive swing because we are into this period where, you know, people have, have sort of figured out that the central banks have lost control of this plot. And um, so the money that's there is already highly levered, as I said, which means they can't tolerate any declines of any sort of size because then they're forced to sell um, to cover margin loans and things. So we've got a... a toxic mess right now in financial markets and uh, you know I think it's it's going to become a bear market I think it's highly likely that we're you know we're we're in correction territory here on most of the world's major indices of at least 10 percent emerging markets are down considerably more than that we're seeing sell-offs in commodities and high yield debt so I think this one you know we've been we've had a couple of false starts uh, in the last couple of years 2011 being the last when you know, QE ran to the rescue at the last minute and revamped everything. But I think this time we may actually be getting the bear market that's been overdue now. So I'm feeling pretty um, optimistic, actually, uh, that that may reveal some value at long last. Well, China has thrown literally trillions of dollars at the Shanghai market, and it still continues to fall. It, mm-hmm. Does that show that it's futile to try to thwart the path of mother nature really yeah absolutely like you're dealing with the weight of um you know gravity here uh things cannot levitate at uh, ridiculous valuations indefinitely and all central bankers ever thought they were doing was buying time for the real economy and for banks to recapitalize. That's all they ever envisioned QE as in the first place. They never thought it was a sustained or a permanent plateau that they were creating in financial markets. And if you look at the early schematics and papers that were written by Bernanke and by um, even the the uh, UK central bank, um, the Bank of England, they're they're 
their plot was always that this would be a spike in asset prices, a short-term spike in CPI, and then hopefully you'd get some recovery in the real economy that would then justify prices or when prices mean reverted, at least you had some momentum in the economy. And in fact, we've seen that that isn't the case, right? So you got the ECB saying this week that they have to probably, you know, increase the amount of bond buying they've already intended to do from, you know, 24% of every issue floated to 33% of every issue floated. You've got the Bank of, of Japan um, buying up in many cases 100% of the bonds that are currently being floated, you know, we've we've left any kind of rational um, plan or program, you know, a long time ago here, and it's just getting to be more desperate by the moment. And so, what you noticed is when the ECB made its announcement on Thursday that they were going to, you know, try and do more in terms of QE, um, stocks rallied in the morning, you know, at the outset, and then basically faded into the afternoon again because. I think, you know, they've really got a ton of time already purchased with this uh, approach, and I think we've run out of runway on the lift here. Has this basically been a waste of government money and private money trying to make sure that these markets are re-energized? Yeah, it has been a complete waste of money. Um, it's allowed some people to siphon out profits, uh, corporate executives in some cases, the banks have made, you know, rude profits uh, speculating. But the problem is if you look at their balance sheets, they're still highly levered and weak. Um, so they haven't really rebuilt strength so much as they've allowed a few to extract out speculative profits. But in terms of stability for the overall economy, you know, I wrote an article this week, Canada's worse this time. And every metric that we look at, as an example, Canada is just one of the countries that's worse this particular cycle and worse in the sense of more financially vulnerable to downside risks here than they were even in the peak of 06, 07, or certainly in 1999, 2000, as we came into the peak of that market cycle. You know, Canada was... Um, much uh, had had much less leverage in household balance sheets back then in, in both of those peaks. Um, we still had much lower valuations in real estate, so we had uh, you know more room to run there in order to sort of buoy up things for a while longer. Um, this time, you've got more debt at every level. Um, also, what's fundamentally different this time, Jim, is that in 2000, you know, we were really coming into a secular boom in uh, commodities, which was Canada's bread and butter. Um, that really peaked in 2008, rebounded a little into 11 on the QE mania, but basically that secular boom is now behind us. It's over. That means that we have a mean reversion process that's likely to be equal and opposite in the other direction for an extended period, and that's why Canada is in a fundamentally worse place today, as is Brazil, as is Russia, as is you know, many um, commodity-centric uh, countries, Australia, New Zealand, all these places have had those earmarks of a secular boom being the ramp in household debt, the ramp in uh, realty prices that now make them very uh, lofty and susceptible to downside, as well as uh, governments who were overly confident in the spending phase, in the revenue boom phase, and didn't f prepare enough for the rainy day of this mean reversion phase. So really everything's uh, in, in sort of worse shape now, and we're facing a lower for longer sustained contraction in revenue, which as you know, as everyone knows from real life experience, if they've ever had it, that carrying twice as much debt while servicing it with the same level of income as you had 25 years ago is a very uh, difficult road to hoe for anybody, and that's indeed exactly what many people are facing. North American debt levels household-wise are twice as high as they were 25 years ago, and yet income is about the same. So what it means is we're going to have less capital to consume with going forward, and that means right-sizing across the board. That's going to mean corporate right-sizing. That's going to mean inventories have to get worked down. That means asset prices have to come lower. Um, everything's going to have to get sort of crunched back to uh, to connect with what makes sense in this new growth uh, level. Prime Minister Harper says this downturn is nowhere near as bad as the last one. That's mm. quoting the Prime Minister. Shouldn't he know what's going on? Mm, yes. Well, unfortunately, um, none of the political leaders 
have any real insight when it comes to the economic cycle. First of all, because they are mostly governed by the corporations in this country, and the corporations are in the business of selling things, and profit momentum is always their goal, so nobody ever has any incentive to declare the downside or risks or suggest that we may be headed into a recession. And, um, you know, every so often one of those recessions takes place in an election year, and, of course, none of the pol politicians want to – none of the – the um, Governing uh, officials want to acknowledge that the recession is even there, and then when it comes comes apparent like it did this month with the recognition that Canada's already in a recession, they want to discount it and say it'll bounce back quick, it'll be over fast and all that good stuff. But in fact, it probably won't, as I've said and explained. It's more of a secular trend than it is a blip. And um, I just think um, no matter what party comes into power now, it's going to be a tough slog um, for Canada um, now, one of the things the Conservatives did was lower some of the social spending programs in the last decade as the Harper government's been in. Um, that's helped them to trim their revenue, uh, sorry, trim their expenses and download some stuff onto the provinces, which is, you know, theoretically, uh, conservative, uh, bookkeeping and decent when you're coming into a slowdown. The difficulty is that it will also mean we feel this one more severely than we might otherwise because people, as I say, have less cushion, have very little savings, are over levered to real estate, too much debt. So you get job losses and contraction in the real economy and people have no buffer. So now they're going to be looking to social programs to make their help make ends meet and where they have been reduced over the past decade, that means you're going to have less of an economic buffer from that social spending than you would otherwise have had. So as I say, I think everything's setting up for Canada to have a worse downturn this time than it had in either of the last two uh, recessions. Certainly in the 2000 recession, Canada, you know, never actually went into an official recession, Jim, if you recall. The United States had one, uh, but Canada didn't officially get recession. And still our stock market and banks and all that good stuff lost half of their value. And in, certainly in the 2008 recession, people would say that Canada came through that one better than most and, you know, had a very uh, limited and sharp bounce back after the downturn. And again, though, our financial markets lost more than half their value and our bank shares and all that good stuff. So it's really about, you know, financial risks right now. And that's what I'm trying to focus people's mind on. I'm not saying the economy is going to be dead forever and that there's no hope or any of that. I'm just saying financial risk right now is extremely high, both because of all the programs that have gone on to pump asset values up with, um, in, create, in creating this leverage and debt that's gone on with it. Another really destructive trend, Jim, that's happened all over the world in the last few years is that um, not only were people borrowing to buy stocks and bonds, corporate debt, that kind of thing on margin, which has been, you know, sort of a, a big risk at the top of each market cycle in the past because people are borrowing to buy these things. But this time, banks and brokerages were selling these loans as consumption funding. Believe it or not, people were borrowing against their security portfolios, not just to buy more securities, but to buy things like cars and art and housing and take trips. So you can just imagine when we have these days where, for example, in August, August the 24th, many stocks uh, – dropped by more than 20% in a given day. Some of the ETFs had huge liquidity crunches and dropped 20% intraday. Well, you get that kind of a drop when you're levered 5, 6, 7, 8 to 1. You get forced selling across the board. And like I said, this time, the selling is going to cascade into more assets than just the stock and bond markets. I think you're going to see forced selling in other assets like art, like you know, possibly real estate, so it's uh, the contagion effects this time, I think, are going to be much more extreme than even in the past two cycles. We'll have more with Danielle Park next on This Week in Money. Unbelievable harmonies, spectacular performance, Bird Dog and the Vintage Electric Band, the ultimate tribute to the Everly Brothers and Simon and Garfunkel in Oliver, October 2nd, in Kelowna, October 3rd. Buy online and save at OnTourTickets.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. We're speaking with Danielle Park editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council Incorporated. Danielle, the Chinese markets closed Thursday and Friday for a holiday. What kind of situation are they going to face when they reopen on Monday? Well, they were doing a lot. This is this is an example of a central bank that's lost all um, 
you know, all sense of decorum, so to speak, like all, uh, any um, appearance of normalcy or free market forces has been completely quashed in the past few weeks because each time that the stock market has gone into a massive convulsion, again, it was goosed ridiculously high. It was up 100% in, uh, you know, a few months before uh, coming into this summer. And over the past, you know, since June, it's given back just about all that gain. So there goes back to my point. In highly levered markets, you can often get, you know, this big boom to the upside, but the market cycle typically mean reverts or takes that back three times as fast as it went up. And that's what we're seeing in China. So they had this, uh, you know, ramp up to try and, um, and, and at the end of the day, it's, if you're watching these, uh, these markets trade, you notice that there's this influx of buying in the final 20 minutes, t- final 40 minutes of every trading day. And this is the, the jiggers and the riggers, I call them. You know, it's the central planners who are trying to create a, a, a green effect for the day to buoy confidence. And then at the same time, you've got algos or computer trading, HFT, just insane practices going on all over and and markets crashing and going into self-help and closing down. I mean, we have just got such a mess on our hands. Um, there's been such a, 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 a lack of anything intelligent in terms of policy and regulation for some time now. Everything's been all about for profit. The exchanges have gone, you know, mad trying to find um, profits everywhere they can and they've totally foregone any... Um, intention of maintaining integrity or fair disclosure or price discovery in the in the usual sense so um, it's really turned into a, a facade and a, and a farce and I think that's going to happen again when markets open you know next week great they were able to you know even with the intervention they weren't able to get a green close heading into their holiday again this week as the as the Euro- European Central Bank was doing its promises to buy more you know stocks Faded as well. So I, this way I think, you know, in the beginning when they started all this QE, it was a new novelty and everyone thought, hey, maybe this will work and people bought the, bought the, the hope of QE, but it's, it's gone on now and, and each bank, each central bank in the world takes its turn with another wave, another wave, another wave. You get diminishing returns and diminishing belief and it turns to a full on recognition that this is the only idea any of them have and that it's not working for the real economy and it's creating great imbalances. So I think we're going to see more downside in China. I think the emerging markets is, you know, the the U.S. dollar strengthening is continuing to suck capital back. And if you think about it this way, Jim, it makes perfect sense. Over the, the, you know, the big credit boom from 2000 to 2011, essentially what happened was um, the U.S. was borrowing money to fund consumption, right? So they were buying things off emerging markets China, Russia, for all sorts of uh, exports, and they were sending U.S. dollars out into the world. Those profits that those countries were making were being stockpiled in financial assets and in U.S. T-bills, that kind of thing. So as this now, you know, mean reversion takes place where the consumption is dropping, uh, the, Can- the U.S. dollar began strengthening because we, the debt scenarios started to go the other way and they started to get in a better fiscal picture relative to other countries as the demand dropped in the United States. And so now you're seeing the things that lent liquidity to the global system when the U.S. dollar was falling are now extracting liquidity back out of the global system as the U.S. dollar has been appreciating. And I think that that's going to continue now. A lot of people and countries borrowed funds in U.S. dollars when rates were low and QE was wild, and now they're having to pay that back. And as the currency appreciates, you know, just like as it is for Canadians that were thinking of buying anything in the U.S., well, it's 30 Two percent more expensive today than it was, uh, you know, a year and a half ago, Jim. So if that's your debt, if you can imagine, if you're owning owing a U.S. debt and you're Canadian based, your debt has got 32 percent more expensive, and that's been happening in emerging markets all over the world. So they're having to, you know, try and liquidate other things to. Um, and China is an example of, of a huge treasury store of U.S. assets that's now having to sell some of those assets to buoy up their own problems at home, to put liquidity back in their own banking system to try and support their currency. So you're getting this great unwind of the leverage that took place during the credit boom, and it's going the opposite way, which means I think we're going to see more money coming out of these other asset markets, more money coming back to the U.S. dollar, to treasuries, to cash, 
as people get more and more spooked by these abrupt drops in other world markets. Danielle, how can people subscribe to your newsletter? Um, our newsletter is only for our clients, actually, but we write Juggling Dynamite, the blog, on a daily basis, and that's free for anyone that wants to uh, sign up. Danielle, thank you very much for chatting with us. Okay, Jim, take care. You take care as well. My guest has been Danielle Park, editor of the popular blog Juggling Dynamite and president of Venable Park Investment Council, Incorporated. That wraps up the show for this week. Thanks to our guests, Ross Clark, Ted Dixon, and Danielle Park. And thank you for listening. Comments or questions for This Week in Money can be emailed to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.